This is Robert from Twin Peaks, and you're listening to Inspirado Projecto. Got a light? Thank you so much, Rob Broski, the woodsman from Twin Peaks Season 3. What a treat for you to stop by. Uh, What we're about to listen to here, folks, is part two of my interview with Martin Schmidt, the renovator of the Golden State Theater out there in Monterey, California. He's also the king of sock monkeys. This is a title I give him, and I would really love it if everyone honored that title. He is an extraordinary sock monkey creator, enthusiast, and inventor. Um, He shipped me a bag of these awesome magnets he made. Um, these limited edition. I don't even know how the heck he went about making these, but um, I've got them hanging up here on the, on the fridge right now. We've got uh, Sock Monkey and the Golden Banana, and he looks like a little Indiana Jones guy. Um, we've got Sock Monkey, and it looks like the Obama poster by uh, Shepard Fairey. Um, let's see, let's see, where else? I've got them all over the refrigerator. They're all over here. Um, jeez. Oh, the Sock Father. Looks just like the Godfather poster. And what else, what else? I think that's it. I think that's it. Oh, you ain't, you ain't nothing but a sock monkey. That's the other one. It looks just like Elvis, little Elvis sock monkey. And then... He also sent me some magnets of uh, f- of photography that he took of various um, theaters that he's been to. Uh, the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California, and up on the marquee there is Psycho, May 10th. Um, and then Sebastian Theater in Sonoma, California, Wiltern Theater, in Los Angeles, California, and up on the up on the marquee there is Queensrÿche. Uh, and then the Fox Theater, Westwood Village, California, IA. And up on the marquee there, we see Red Planet. It's very, very highly creative. So we're going to get on to uh, the second part of my interview with him. But first, we're going to hear a friendly word from our buddy, Henry D. Horse, and see what we can learn from him today. Thank you for listening to Inspirato Projecto. David Lynch personally started a campaign in Hollywood to get Laura Dern an Oscar nomination for her performance in Inland Empire. He sat on the side of the road with a cow during this campaign, which was, unfortunately, unsuccessful. Stay tuned to Inspirato Projecto for more fun facts. Welcome back to Inspirato Projecto. Uh, Projecto Part 2 here with Martin Schmidt. He is going to tell us an extraordinary story, and I've got more questions for him, um, concerning the Golden State Theater and the history of its architecture and all that is connected to it. So, Martin, what is this extraordinary story that you're going to... Oh, okay. So, uh, in your last episode, we were talking about the the chandeliers that are hanging over the balcony in the theater. Yes. There's this big disc-shaped chandelier, one on either side. And those were missing from the theater for 28 years. Uh, In our last episode, I related how they divided up the theater into three auditoriums. They put two in the balcony and one downstairs um, in the main floor. And they did that in 1976, and the walls weren't taken down until 2004 when Warren Dewey bought the building. Um, At the time they put the walls up, they took those two chandeliers down. I don't know really why they did. I think they maybe thought they were going to be in the way of the projectors or something, Mm. which I don't think they were. But anyhow, for whatever reason, they took them down. Maybe they just wanted to get the clutter out of there. I don't know. And they sold them. And for years, nobody knew where they were. Uh, And I knew from going up there, you could see that there would have been chandeliers because there's this big decorative plaster rosette in the ceiling Mm. where they were hanging over them. Um... So I knew there were, there were chandeliers there at one time, but they had long since gone missing. And then one day, uh, several years into the restoration, uh, my friend Gary Parks and I, whom I mentioned in the last episode, he and I were in Berkeley, 
at uh, an old movie theater there, much smaller than this one. I don't remember what the name of it was. Gary would remember. And we were talking to the manager of the theater, who, like us, was an aficionado of these old theaters. And uh, it was our first time meeting him. Gary, Gary knew of him, uh, but I don't think they'd met in person before then. So, uh, or I, maybe Gary knew him, but he was introducing me. It's been so long, I can't, it's like 30 years ago. Um, so uh, the gentleman asked Kevin, I think his name was Kevin King, and he asked me, so where are you from? I said, Monterey. And he went, oh, the Golden State Theater, yeah. He said to me, you guys are missing a couple of chandeliers from the balcony, aren't you? And Gary and I were like, yeah, how do you know about that? And he said, I know where they are. They were in storage at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, which, as I mentioned earlier, was designed by the same architects as this one. Total coincidence. Nothing to do with the story. Brilliant. Uh, but the man who owns that theater, his name is Alan Michon, and he is also a fan of these old theaters. And he, for a long time, I don't know if he's still doing this, but he was buying uh, different old theaters and restoring them and using them commercially as movie theaters because uh, he was a sort of real estate developer and doing other things as well. Uh, he, had his, he had his hands in a lot of businesses. He was also an antiquities dealer, uh, which I think he still is. Anyway, but he was always on the lookout for old movie palace fixtures in antique stores, or flea markets, wherever mm. he could find them, you know, estate sales, whatever. Because whenever he bought a new theater and went to refurbish it, he liked to refurbish it with period things. Even if they weren't the original ones to that theater, at least they'd look right, you know. And so when these chandeliers, I don't know how many hands they went through after they left this theater in 1976. I have no idea. But they came up for sale at some point. He found them and bought them. And remarkably, the oral history of where they had come from went with them. Incredible. It wasn't written down anywhere, but each owner told the next one, oh, these came from the Gold State Theater in Monterey. Wow. So, yeah. Was, they just handed down the story. Yeah, exactly. Which is pretty remarkable, actually, because most is. of the times the story would be lost, separated from the, the artifacts themselves. So the fact that the, the story went with it is kind of a miracle for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the total coincidence that Gary and I happened to be in this one place, this one Brilliant. night, met this guy who knew where the chandeliers were, knew the history, knew Monterey. Oh my gosh. And so I contacted Mr. Michon shortly after that. And I'm trying to remember when this was. This was late 1990s. Uh, I think 1998, something like that. So I contacted him when I got home, um, found out the phone number of the theater, and I called and got connected to him and told him who I was and what we were doing here. And at that time, this place was still owned by United Artists Theaters, and they were still showing first-run movies, which is the same thing that Mr. Michon was doing with the Grand Lake and his other theaters mm. up in the Bay Area. He was showing first-run films. So United Artists was a competitor for him. And he scratched his head over it for a little while, and he said, well, he said, since United Artists is one of my competitors, I really don't want to, you know, enrich one of my competitors, uh -huh. which I can understand. <laughs> yeah. But he said, I'll make a deal with you. He said, if... The Golden State Theater is ever sold and put in private hands. Contact me, and I will sell you the chandeliers. He was as good as his word. It was years. It was, as I say, I think that conversation took place about 1998 or so, and it wasn't until 2004 that this building was sold by United Artists to a private owner. And at that time, I called Mr. Michon up, and the chandeliers were still there. He was as good as his word. And he sold the chandeliers to Warren Dewey. We uh, took Warren's van. We went up there. He paid for them, and we brought them home and oh reinstalled my gosh. them 28 years after they were removed from the theater. Incredible. So they were back home again. So that's quite a story, I think. That is quite uh, a story. So The uh, fact that Universe like placed you there at that specific moment in time mm -hmm. and just and the way that the dominoes the fell. And the story that went with them, which normally wouldn't happen. And the fact that the, that the guy said, I will not, I you know... He was I won't give this to you now, but I will yeah. if it's if he it told changes me, hands. He told so me in two thousand and four that he actually had turned down offers from several other buyers during that time that were interested in him because he knew what we wanted them. Oh my which gosh. Was really nice of him. That's incredible. Yeah. So he knew he had he had a feeling, he had hope mm -hmm. for, for you guys that yeah. things would turn around. So yeah, it was a really nice favor he did for us. Yeah, absolutely. I love uh, that this community sticks together like this. Mm-hmm. Well, Sometimes it does, in, in mm -hmm. the good times, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't always, but... 
So are you uh, gonna? So now that you have the the miniature of the, um, the I'm scale just thinking model this would be side, so yeah. awesome since you got the scale model. It could be a fun promo with your sock monkeys. Like I'm just imagining, kind of like a King Kong kind of thing. Like, right, ah, here they come. The <laughs> yeah, it's a great idea. You know, because you can cut it with the footage of the real Golden State Theater. Right, you know, and a punch in. It's like, ah, here come the sock monkeys. Oh heck, we could probably do even better than that. You know, you can get uh, uh, video compositors who can who can uh, superimpose one scene on another and make it look seamless. Brilliant. Right? We could take video of the actual facade, have a giant sock monkey stalking up, climbing up the building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how is the sock fun. monkey business going at this oh, point? Oh, good. Yeah, it's, it's not really a profit-making business, but I just do it as a sideline for fun and make people you, happy. So people just come um, across it on the YouTube channel? or what, That, what uh, or they, it's word of mouth. You know, or sometimes I make a special one. A uh, person may not even have thought of it, like the one I made for you. Yeah. You know, and uh, and send it to them as a gift. Um, let's see, what was the anyone one who I did sees that sock monkey? They just they flip out. It's like <laughs> one I did just recently. Here, I'll show you a picture of it. I had uh, my car was in the body shop for repairs. A lady um, backed into my car in a parking lot at very low speed. It just damaged my bumper. So fortunately, it wasn't anything major. But um, I wanted to have it fixed. So. Um, took it into the body shop for repairs. And um, when I was there uh, dropping the car off, of course we got talking with the receptionist and the, and the estimator and so on. And for some strange reason, the conversation came around to sock monkeys. I can't understand why. Wow, <laughs> incredible. Anyhow, but the, the, the two girls that were, that were at the reception counter there, they were enchanted. I showed them the, my gallery here on Instagram. I love it. And uh, oh, they were looking through the whole thing, they loved it. And so when I went to pick the car, no, it was, uh, no, it was still while I was dropping the car off. That's right. I thought to myself, you know, I should really make a, a sock monkey for them just as a gift for the for the uh, for the office, you know. That's cool. And so I did. Uh, I went online to their website and I copied. Their, they did a screenshot of their logo. No way! I, I had to trace it in my Illustrator program because oh it was really God. low resolution. So I made this T-shirt for the monkey Dude. with the shop's logo on it. Incredible! And um, made the monkey and dressed him in jeans and the T-shirt. And when I went to pick the car up, I had the monkey with me in a bag. And I gave it to the estimator. It was a Saturday, so the, the receptionists weren't there. Uh, but the, the estimator that was working overtime, and he said, hey, your car's ready. And, and because of, we had this massive power failure because of the storms, you know, that week, we were without power for a couple of days where I live. And um, so I didn't get his text messages on Thursday and Friday saying the car was ready. Mm. <laughs> didn't get it till the power and the phones came back on on Saturday. And then I got these text messages from him. So I called him right back. And he says, yeah, come and pick it down. And he says, I'm here till 1 o'clock. So... I went down there and took the sock monkey with me because uh, I had made it. it the, the car was in the shop for like five days. So I gave me enough time to make the sock monkey. And I gave it to him, and this big smile spread over his face as he, as he pulled it out of the bag. And he says, oh, the girls will love this. And he put it right there behind the counter <laughs> with, my, with my business card Oh, on I it. love it. That's incredible. And, uh, so they would see it first thing when they came in on Monday. So cool, so man. I haven't heard from them, but... Um, I did get a new follower on Instagram. I think it's one of the girls who works there. Oh, that's great. And she posted a picture of it on her Instagram account. So. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So, that's you, that sew. you sew. You so sew the, the... Oh, yeah. I sew everything. the monkeys, the costumes from scratch. Incredible. I start with a pair of socks and some stuffing and uh, a couple of yards of material, whatever the material happens to be. I've, I've created all my own patterns over the years. I've been doing this for about 20 years now. Um, and... Nobody makes patterns for sock monkey clothing. A lot of people use teddy bear clothing, but the proportions mm. aren't right because the teddy bears have little short, stumpy arms and mm -hmm. legs, and sock monkeys are long and gangly. Oh, yeah. So the clothes don't really fit. So I just started designing my own clothes and my own patterns from scratch, and I've refined them over the years, and every time I need to make a new garment, now I have usually an existing garment that I can start with and then just alter it. And I save all my designs on the computer. So that whenever I need a pattern, I just print it out on my printer, cut it out, and you have a little paper Whoa. pattern, pin it onto the material in the traditional way. And so I've got, you know, patterns for T-shirts and jeans. Here's the space suit for the wow. uh, astronaut. You know what? You could probably sell those patterns on Etsy to I, people who want to build their own sock I might monkeys. Do that you could just sell days. those patterns, like five bucks a pattern or mm -hmm. something. something. You know, like to that, them, yeah. they'd be totally work, exactly. worth it to them. They're like, oh my gosh, and this is great. Yeah. Be a little, uh, it's like selling a recipe for a special, yeah, you know, exactly. Danish or something. I thought about it. Uh, I probably will do it one of these days. One of the drawbacks is that there are many different ways to make a sock monkey. Mm. You'll notice that mine don't have a neck. 
True. Right? The head True. and the body just sort of blend seamlessly. But a lot of people put a neck in their sock, which you do by sewing a little bit of thread around it and then tightening the thread to, to gather the sock in. Then you have a separate head and neck. Oh. Well, of course, since mine don't have shoulders, I, I use this particular uh, pattern that accommodates that. But if you had a monkey that had a separate head and neck, he would have little shoulders. So the shirt would have to be designed oh. differently. But what I might do, um, since there aren't too many variations on the basic sock monkey. There are a few. That's one of them, and there are a few others. Uh, but that's there may be three or four variations mm. on the sock monkey. So I could make um, a, a sock monkey in each of the different styles and then start creating patterns for each of that body style and that's then sell cool those that idea. way. I might do that um, in my copious free time. The, this is uh, great. So this is the astronaut that I made many years ago. And his uh, helmet there is a light globe, an acrylic globe from a light fixture. Oh, cool. And then on his back, he can't see it in this shot, but I have another shot that shows the back of him. And he has a life support pack on his back, <laughs> which is an electrical box from the hardware store. Oh, Pl cool. Plastic electrical box. And, and uh, I love the little alien, too. It's still yeah, brilliant. I made it's him out so of bright brilliant. green socks. And oh, he's my got God. Little, the way you got his eyes. Yeah. Little uh, <laughs> oblong buttons there for, for <laughs> alien eyes. It's so great. And uh, then this is a pair of glasses that I made for... Oh. Um, for a very dear friend of mine, she has a grandson living in the Netherlands, and he's about 10 or 11 years old right now, and he is a huge fan of the Beatles. And so she wanted to give a really special Christmas gift to him, so she commissioned me to make Beatles sock monkeys. And I, I don't have a picture on Instagram, but I do, I think I have a picture on another gallery, which I might be able to show you. Anyway, but, so I made them and delivered them, and they're dressed like, the uh, the cover of the Sergeant Pepper's album. Oh my god! All those gosh. satin outfits with oh all the different colors. Oh my gosh! Because I wanted something that looked fairly iconic, and most of the time yeah. they just looked like regular guys yeah. in suits and little narrow ties. You know, it could be anything. And oh then yeah. I don't remember the Sergeant Pepper album, so I thought I'll make one like that. But I Brilliant. neglected to make because I couldn't figure out how to do it at the time, and I ran out of time. I neglected to make glasses for John Lennon monkey. So I made these glasses a few months later, and I gave them to her, and she mailed them across uh, the ocean. To, oh, I love it! To her grandson there. So John Lennon so he, now has the glasses. Are those? those is that made, made with a, a made 3D out of printer? A piece of coat hanger. No way. Yep. I took a piece of coat hanger, straightened it out, and bent uh, with with a pair of needle nose pliers and a lot of patience. Dude, uh, into a, a shape for the sock monkey. That's incredible. Here's my Shakespeare. This is William Sockspear. Dude, I love it. I made that as a special gift for a friend of mine. We've known each other since we were kids, and we've done theater together for he's decades. He's got his quill. It's great. Yeah, he's got his quill pen, and his uh, in his left hand is a little scroll with a quote from one no of Shakespeare's way. plays. It says, "I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face." Which is a that, quote from a Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, cool! Oh my gosh! Oh my so, gosh! Who says that quote? Uh, it's one of the rustic characters. Uh, it is Nick Bottom, the Weaver, uh, who is playing the character of Pyramus in the play within a play. Because mm. you know that you have the uh, half a dozen or so. Oh yeah, they're what they call the in there. rustic characters. Oh, uh, and they are perform. They, it's a subplot within the play. There's like three different subplots that intertwine in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm. Okay. And so the, uh, the Duke of Athens is getting married. This is part of the plot of the play. And um, so these, these rustic characters, lower class uh, tradesmen, uh, one of them is a weaver, Nick Bottom is his name. Another one is uh, a bellows mender, and he would be mel mending the bellows for the blacksmith forge and things like this. Another one is a tinker who you know, used to make uh, copper pots and things like that. So they're all uh, craftsmen. But not terribly sophisticated and, you know, and then the kind of lower class in society, but good hearted people. And they decide they want to get together and put on a play for the Duke's entertainment for the occasion of his wedding. So and the uh, the plot of the play is basically uh, uh, plagiarized directly from Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> it, great. It was OK for Shakespeare to steal from himself. Yeah, you know? what a brilliant right. idea. And so. Uh, so Francis Flute, the bellows mender, who is a boy, has to play uh, Thisbe, which is the Juliet-type character, all right? And then Nick Bottom, the weaver, is playing Pyramus, which is the Romeo-type character. And then you have another character playing a lion uh, who attacks uh, Thisbe later on in the play. And, and then you have another character who plays a wall, uh, the personification of a wall. 
uh, which separates the, see, the Pyramus and Thisbe in the play are neighbors, but they're separated by this wall between their gardens. And it's the same plot as, as Romeo and Juliet, basically. And their oh, parents don't brilliant. like each other and they don't want them to see each other and so on. And, uh, but there's a little chink in the wall, a little crack where the stones are missing and they can talk and whisper through the <laughs> wall. And uh, so they decide that one of the characters is going to portray the wall, right? So he gets, he, they make him like this plasterboard costume, kind of like a sandwich sign, right? In front oh, that's of that. great. And he has a, let's see, uh, so he's holding a stone in one hand and then he holds up his fingers to represent the chink in the wall. Oh, that that's the, great. That the lovers are talking through. And uh, so Pyramus interacts with him and, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, I can't remember his line. Uh, Thisbe comes up and talks to the wall. She says, oh, wall, full often hast thou heard my bones for parting my fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair knit up in thee. Uh, and that's when Pyramus says, I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy and I can hear my Thisbe's face. He gets his words mixed up. Oh, that's great. Um, so, yeah, it was lots of fun. And they have, one, they have another character playing the moon or the man in the moon, oh, actually. Oh, cool. And, uh, so, yeah, this, and, is, and then, so they, they uh, what is it? They arrange a tryst at this remote location. It's, a, it's the tomb of some character named Ninus who had died many years before. Here again, as I say, it's Romeo and Juliet all over again. And so they meet there. Thisbe gets there first, and this lion appears out of the woods, and um, he's just eaten some lamb or something, so his, his jaws are all bloody. And she screams, runs away in terror, but she drops her shawl, and the lion picks up the shawl and mangles it, gets blood all over it, and then drops the shawl and runs away. And then Pyramus comes and sees the bloody shawl. Uh -oh. He thinks Thisbe has been killed by the lion. Oh, my God. So he goes to kill himself, and then Thisbe comes in. It's just, as I say, it's Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. So, but that's so that's the story of the, that's great. the Shakespeare monkey. So I gave wow. it, so you, did the you, only monkey I've done a... Were you in it? I was in that. I was in the play on three different occasions, three different productions over a span of many years, playing three different characters. The first time I was a teenager and I played Peter Quince, the carpenter, who is the guy who, who organizes the whole play. Oh, cool. Uh, and he, he's got his hands full trying to keep all the other guys focused. And, uh, and the second time I played... Francis Flute, the bellows mender, uh, who plays Thisbe. And then the third time I played, I think I played Snug the Joiner, who's the one who plays the lion. And he oh, Snug cool. would have been a, a furniture maker or something. So Snug the Joiner is his name. And uh, so, yeah, and this was over a period of, I don't know, 20 years maybe. Um, have you been in a lot of plays? Uh, I lost count a long time ago. <laughs> I, I started, do you still do theater? I don't have much time or energy for it anymore, but I still have contacts in the local theater uh, scene. They all know me there. Um, <clears throat> but you were in a quite, a, quite a few plays, huh? I started in uh, a children's theater uh, classes in Carmel when I was 11 years old. Mm. And so that would have been in 1969. And um, I stayed with them through high school. And then after I graduated high school, uh, I started working with the adult production division. It was a nonprofit children's theater, and they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the staff of the theater, uh, which was the director and the costumer and various other people that ran the theater, they also would produce plays with, with them in them as fundraisers for the mm. Children's Theater nonprofit. Mm. Okay. They called themselves the staff players because they were the actual staff of the organization. And so I went on, after high school, I went on to work with them uh, for quite a number of years after that um, in their productions. And at that point, I gravitated from actually acting in the shows to backstage work because I found that I really enjoyed that more. So I did lighting and sound and prop making and things like that. Oh, cool. Um, so that kind of graduated into the fact that you're able to... Did, I uh, did able you to, do the costume design and stuff, too, for a theater? Were you, uh, were you in the wardrobe department? No, no, I never did uh, costume design. Um, the, uh, the costuming that I've done came along later, just out of... You know, many years later, just out of... My own interest in because I imagine you're back there stuff. sewing up the uh, what, what is it the um, little shop of horrors uh, Venus oh, the, fly the trap plant. or something yes, yeah right. like you sewing up the tentacles or something no no I never did that but um, there was another production group here which is still around um, 
and they did a production of Little Shop of Horrors one summer that I ran lights for, I think it was. So I got to watch that show. It was a joy to watch. And they, yeah, they built their own plant costume. Oh my God. Because it grows. Yeah, it grows. They, well, it was like three different, uh, three different things. One was a little puppet in the, in the flower pot, right? And the next one is a larger puppet. Uh, and then the, the, the giant one actually had a man inside it. Oh my God. And it, it was constructed in such a way that the, the plant could swallow people. And the way that worked um, is that the the actor inside the puppeteer had his legs spread apart and he would open the mouth of the of the plant with his arms and then the person would dive in between his legs and get swallowed by the plant and then he closed the mouth. Oh my head. god, that's great! And then they had I think they had a couple other puppeteers working the tentacles and things. It was really elaborate. And after that show closed. Um, the uh, the very first thing the production company did was to rent the costume out to other productions. So really, an idea. Yeah, so that would made money for them at the same time. So, so the costume became yeah, famous, so to speak. The costume became a celebrity. Yeah, right around town. Right. It's like I saw that costume before. <laughs> well, actually, it, w- it went to other towns. I'm not sure exactly where, um, but it was yeah, it was rented by other production companies in other cities. So it it made the rounds for a number of years. Probably wore out after a while. But uh, what was your play. favorite role? My favorite Or what role? were some of your favorite roles? Oh, goodness. Hmm. Were you ever in any David Mamet plays? No, never did that. Um, in, the, in the children's theater that I was in, it was called uh, Children's Experimental Theater, or CET. There was actually nothing experimental about it. She just called it that for tax purposes. <laughs> but um, all our techniques were well, tried and so proven over many years. Are, I, I'm not sure but, exactly how you got this bottle. Um, so we are a venue that wait Go in another office. Sorry, you guys oh yeah. Actually, uh, oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, no, that's so fine. We, uh, uh, preferably not that way. We actually don't really have people back in that area. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, well, we're trying guys. to find a quiet place to record, and there's yeah, a yeah, good dearth of those. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, so the, the Children's Theater. Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, gumdrop footstools. Um, it, as I say, it was a nonprofit, mm-hmm. and they didn't have a terribly large budget. Uh, the, the costumes were made by their resident costumer on a shoestring. Basically, she would go to uh, garage sales and, and thrift stores and so forth and get various items of clothing and then alter them, add embellishments, modify them for whatever period piece we were doing. Um, so the, the place survived financially by the skin of its teeth for many, many, many years. And as a result, she couldn't afford to pay royalties on uh, scripts, right, that she would need to rent to do a production. Mm. Most other places, they, they go to a, um, a script rental place and they will you know, have to pay a certain amount of royalties depending on, I'm not sure how the arrangement is. Um, but she couldn't really afford to do that, so she typically wrote her own shows. Marsha Hovick was her name, by the mm. way. Um, and her costumer's name was Lowell Schuler, And they were fixtures here on the peninsula for decades. Um, Anyway, so, yeah, Marsha would typically write her own plays for the children to do. And this was actually an advantage because she typically wrote plays that were set in various historical periods. Oh, there was one about the French Revolution. It was called The Great Fear. And um, let's see, she would, for the younger kids, uh, she would do fairy tales, like Grimm's Fairy Tales. So... Uh, I remember one of the one of the earliest plays that I was in when I played the bear in Snow White and Rose Red. Oh, you know that story. Um, and so the advantage to this was not only did it save her money, but the kids who were in her classes as they were rehearsing and performing these shows, they would get a, a part of a classical education slipped in under the radar without them realizing it. Yeah, it's brilliant. Because they would learn some of the historical context that the Very play would cool. take place in. 
and uh, or the the history is of the of the um, fairy tales or whatever is the case may be, and uh, then the older kids once you got into high school started doing Shakespeare and Moliere. Okay, that's incredible. And here again, they're both long out of the realm of copyright, so no royalties involved. Mm. And but at the same time, you would get a classical education um, by doing these plays. Incredible. And, and, um, we did a I did a. Uh, Moliere play one time. It was really fun. It was called the, I think it was the Doctor in Spite of Himself, and um, that was a lot of fun to do. I did several Moliere's. I think my favorite, one of my favorite parts, was actually a bit part in um, a Moliere play called School for Wives. And this was long after I had graduated from CET, and I was working with the staff players, and um, they did. A production of School for Wives, the plot of which is that there's this this old miserly guy, and he uh, he decides that he, he he's met this young attractive woman, and he decides he wants to marry her, right? And but he uh, he decides he wants to teach her how women are supposed to behave. It's very chauvinistic. And um, so I don't remember the entire plot anymore. You'd have to look it up. But it's typical wacky Moliere stuff. And, of course, the original play was in French. And so um, this was one of the translations. There, and You typically encounter many different translations of Moliere's mm. work. And this particular one was done all in rhyming couplets, which was pretty cool, actually. Um, and must have been really hard to, to translate, but whoever had done the translation had done a masterful job. Uh, anyway, so I was actually doing lights for the show, and I wasn't intended to be on stage at all. But partway through the run of the show, several weeks into it, the actor who played the notary, oh, at one point the, the old man calls in a notary to, to draw up a marriage contract between him and his prospective mm. bride. And it was just a bit part. He's only on there for one scene. Um, but the actor who played the notary had to go out of town for some reason. I don't remember what it was. But he was going to be gone one particular weekend, which would be three shows, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And he didn't, we, our group was so small, we didn't have understudies for anybody. You know, We just sort of winged it. And so after the, the, uh, the news came through that he was going to have to go out of town... Um, after one of the, it was either one of the shows or one of the rehearsals, I forget which, uh, we were all gathered around, sitting around in the theater and trying to figure out how we're going to replace this guy for one weekend. Now, I had never seen a script for the show. I didn't need one because the lighting cues were very simple. It was lights up at the beginning of the scene, lights down at the end of the scene. So I didn't really need a script. I could just wing it. And... um, but I had seen several performances by that point. Um, probably, I think, six or eight or performances at least. And the way my memory works, if I hear something repetitively, it tends to stick in my memory. Okay? So I knew his entire part. No way. Without ever having seen a script. Incredible. So we're all sitting around. Marsha had directed the show, and she's trying to figure out who she's going to get. And they're all talking amongst themselves. I'm just kind of sitting in the background. And she said, well, who are we going to get to replace him? And I said, piped up. I said, Marsha, I can do the part. And she said, oh, well, uh, Lowell, do you, do you think you could fit a costume for him? Because I'm much taller than most people. And Lowell looked me up and down. She says, yeah, I got some things I can cobble together. We'll make it work. And Marsha said, well, we need to find him a script. Does anybody and everybody else hung under the scripts very gener- uh, jealously because, you know, they wanted to refresh their memories periodically mm. so they keep the part fresh. And nobody could spare a script, and, and uh, Marsha said, well, I said, Marsha, I don't need a script. I know the part, and she, but she just didn't listen, and she was asking all these, well, you, can we get a script from here? Do we have one in the office, people looking in the office? I said, Marsha, I finally put my foot down. I said, I don't need a script. I know the part. She didn't believe me, so I turned to the actor that I was going to be playing opposite, and I said, give me my cue. And he did, and we ran through the entire scene right then and there. Dude. Word perfect. You're like, give me my cue. <laughs> and at the end of the scene, 
I turned to Marsha, and she was sitting there with her mouth open. <laughs> oh, my God. It's incredible. She said, well, I guess you don't need a script. Okay. <laughs> that's great. So I did that part for that weekend. Incredible. And it was a total blast to you because I threw everything in the kitchen sink. I bet. Into it. I bet. Because you, you're just like, okay, I just got this weekend. Yeah. I'm yeah. just going to really go just, for it. Yeah, let her rip. And so uh, I made him this little nearsighted character. We're kind of hunched over, right? And I think I had a little, a little uh, pencil nose glasses or something. And uh, so I was kind of squinting and blinking all the time because he was nearsighted. And I gave him this squeaky voice, and um, let's see what else. Oh, yeah, and I had a, I had a sheaf of papers, because I was a notary, of course, and drawing up marriage contracts and various other legal documents, and a big black quill pen, uh, just a, uh, like a big crow feather or something. didn't actually have a pen. Oh, having there. props are the best. I oh, love, yeah. I love it. And, yeah, I could wave it at his face <laughs> and whatever. Yeah. It was wonderful. So uh, <laughs> come the first performance, so I would, what I would do is, since there wasn't any backstage connection between the light booth and the dressing rooms, I would get, before the house opened, I would get in costume and makeup, and I would go and sit up in the light booth before the house opened and sit there during the entire show. And then In your costume and makeup? In costume and makeup. Ready, ready to rock, right. run and down. Then, yeah, and there weren't any light cues during my scene. Perfect. So when the scene started, oh when the scene was about to start, I would uh, walk down out of the light booth, cross through the lobby, and go backstage and be ready to enter, all right? And then I'd walk on, do the part, and then walk off and walk back through the lobby, back up the leg booth, get ready for the next light. Wow. Tour. So it was, a, it was a cool exercise in versatility. But um, <clears throat> so that first night, uh, I come on stage and I'm like, oh, there you are, sir. I am the notary. So there's a contract which you'd have me draw. And he says, how shall I do it? He's muttering to himself this whole time. This is one of those scenes where he's talking to himself, and I think he's talking to me. Oh, that's right. So I'm that's responding great. to him, and he's just muttering to himself. That's great. So, he say, so I said, there's a contract which you'd have me draw? And he says, how shall I do it? And I said, according to the law. And he goes, I must be prudent and think what course is best. And I say, I shall do nothing against your interest. And so we ran through the whole scene, and what happens is I'm following him around the stage, thinking that I'm talking to him, and he's just talking to himself, right? And finally, he turns around and bumps into me, and then he gets really agitated that this fool has been trailing him around. He doesn't realize that I'm the notary, that he's actually summoned to be there. Oh, he my God, that's great. Guy. So he gets really agitated and pushes me down onto a bench. Uh, I forget. Uh, I, I can't remember the whole part anymore, but... Um, so, yeah, he turns around and bumps into me, and I'm rattling on about legalities and things like this. And he's saying, oh, what, what, are you doing? what are you in my way for? And he says, uh, when, when, I, something, when I have need of you, I'll send word. Until then, stop blathering, you blatherskite. And he sits me down, and he storms off the stage. And I was supposed to turn to the audience and say, he's mad, I judge, and I think my judgment is right. And then the two, <laughs> his two servants come in, and I say to them, your master sent you to fetch me. Isn't that so? And they go, Yes. And I say, how you feel about him, I don't know. But I regard him as a senseless boor. <laughs> Tell him I said so. And I stormed off. It was such a fun part to do. It's great. And, it's well, amazing. It's, you remember all these lines. Yeah, it's crazy. It's the way my memory works. It's, it's something I've been blessed with over the years. But um, the thing was that it was something totally unexpected to happen during that first performance. When he sat me down on the bench, he, grabbed, he puts his hands on my shoulders and pushes me down on the bench. And I didn't realize it, but his sleeve, his big sleeve, and his sleeve caught my big black feather pin oh. and snapped it in half. Oh! So it was just kind of hanging oh. right through. <laughs> and I didn't realize it. And what, oh the, the bit of business that I had come up with was, and we did this all through rehearsals, uh, as he stormed off, I would throw the pen at him. And, of course, it would just sort of go fuff, 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 through the air and fall on the floor. It wouldn't actually hit him. But it was this expression of rage. And so I did that. He sits me down. I didn't realize it, but the feather broke. I threw it at him. Fuff, 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 it falls on the floor. And I turned to the audience and delivered my line. He's mad, I judge, and I think my judgment's right. And then I would go upstage and pick up the feather. And when I picked it up, I saw that it was broken. And I turned around to the audience it was this perfect ad lib moment. Turn around to the audience, holding it in front of me with this expression of utter sorrow on my face that my it's favorite great. quill had been broken. It's great. And it was just so totally extemporaneous. I love that. And the audience just broke up. 
And uh, those are those improvisational moments that the yeah. audience really loves because yeah. you roll with it. And they you know? knew it wasn't supposed to happen that way, and but you roll with it, and it makes it even better. And then his servants come on, and I worked myself into a lather over the thing, and then stormed off, looking at this bed like, oh, man, this is my favorite quilt. <laughs> And the audience just burst out into a round of applause as oh, I walked that's up. Great. And um, all my fellow actors who were in the play, who, the ones who weren't on the stage at that time, I didn't realize this, but they had all gathered backstage and they were watching me through the wings and they gave me an ovation as well as that's I That's great. So I think that has to be one of my proudest moments. Oh in my theater. God, I could totally see why. That's incredible, so, man. Yeah, it's wow, a fun memory. Well, listen, Martin, I have to get up there for the, for the yeah, sound yeah, check. The but dude, time, time flew forward. with us talking, sure man. Thank you so much My for, pleasure. you know, t- taking me up, showing me up here again and give me all that information. I was so happy to hear about your theatrical past because I have a whole theater past too. And oh, just cool. hearing people's, oh my gosh, just hearing people's joy of, of acting on stage and, you know, being in those ensemble moments and improvisation, of course. I love imp- improv. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad I got to show you some of the little nuances, the little details. Thank, the you, that would, that would thank you for that. Thank you for that. People's notice. Oh, I was going to show you one other thing too. Oh yeah. Lots of here, and they're not big sound checks at the moment, so it's not much. Um, this place was built in a great hurry in only one year. And oh I my actually, gosh! I talked to um, a we gentleman. He's, he's no longer with us, but he was one of the last. He was the last surviving construction worker who built this place. His name was Ed Brooks, and he told me how much of a hurry they were in when they built this place. He was finishing the stair railings on the afternoon before opening night. Oh, yeah. He said the the foreman uh, that day it was August sixth, nineteen twenty six. Uh, he said, "Ed, come over here. You got to finish these stair railings by five o'clock." And he looked at him and it needed a lot of work. And he said he worked like mad to finish all the stereos oh in the lobby by 5 o'clock. Oh. He said at 5 o'clock he went home, changed his coat, came back for the opening night show. Oh, my gosh. But the thing was, they I didn't realize this for many years, but there were a couple of details they forgot to install. Oh, my gosh. And these were one of them. These four things right here really? were missing. They had never No been way. Played. You can see there's four more on the other side. Oh, my gosh. Right? But these, these are little, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, little ornament things over this, uh, well, for the benefit of your listeners, we're standing in one of the entrances to the balcony. There's this oh, yeah. archway over my head. And these ornaments uh, sort of anchor the yeah, bottom of the archway. Yeah, on either side of the, uh, where you see the exit sign, you'll see how these things kind of come down. They're almost like little, I don't know, yeah, like ledges of some yeah, sort or something. Yeah, cornices, I think you call Cornices. Them. Anyway, so yeah, these, had, I found a spare one up in the, the storeroom on the third floor. Um, but there was only one of them, and these these archways just sort of ended without these ornaments on them. Oh my gosh! And so, unfortunately, the the spare one that I had found disappeared. Some one of the theater ushers took it home, I guess. But there was another one on the other side, which was becoming detached from the wall, just due to age and use. People would bump into it, and so on. So, with the manager's permission, here again, this is during United Artists days. I clipped the wires that were holding it onto the wall, took it down, took it home. Uh, the corners were all broken and there were big dings and chips in it, so I repaired all that with modeling clay. Oh, cool. Okay. Made a, a urethane mold, like a rubber mold from it, Whoa. and cast these four replacements. So this is my work. Incredible. So I cast these four replacements for it, and a Incredible. friend and I installed them here on the wall and painted them to match. So that is brilliant. That is my work right there. That is cool. So you have so many contributions to this extraordinary place, man. This place is great. Well, as I say, I grew up going to movies here. This was the most magical building I'd ever seen. I've been in love with it since I was a little kid. And I'm 65 now, so that's a good many years worth of water under that bridge. Oh, my gosh. So, How yeah. cool that you've been able to, like, we go way back. This stamp, building. you know, put your stamp into this I've place. I've wanted to restore that... it ever since 1976. Wow, man. When they, when they put the walls up in the balcony, the first time I came in and I saw it, I thought, what a tragedy it was. They had to do it to the beautiful old place. Oh my and that God. was the day in 1976 when I first thought, gee, it'd be nice to restore this place. Oh, someday. my God. The idea stayed in the back of my mind until the late 1980s when I finally had an opportunity to start working on it. God, that is so exciting. And I spent 15 years um, actively hands-on. All this paint in the lobby, this is all my work. Oh well, my, my, my volunteers, I can't take all the credit for it. My volunteers did a lot of it, oh most of it. Um, but this, uh, the auditorium and the lobby were spray painted in the 50s, plain white. 
and all this gorgeous ornamentation was painted over. If you can imagine, this whole place, just white, it looked like a mausoleum. But that was the only, that was the only view of it I had ever known because it was done mm. before I was born. But then when I started collecting old photographs of it, which I have a, a small collection of old photographs at home, uh, they were black and white, but you could see where there was gold and different shades of gray, which indicated different colors. Mm. So with the permission of United Artists, um, some volunteers and I went up and scraped paint in strategic spots to find out what the colors were underneath. We took uh, paint chips from the hardware store and matched the paint. Oh, man. And what we have to do is match it under this specific lighting, because otherwise, if you, if you take a chip of paint under a different light, try to match it there, it won't match here. So we got a bunch of paint chips, and we held them up until we found the, the correct colors. And we went, and the manager paid for the paint out of his own pocket, bless oh his heart, because he didn't have a, a budget, a maintenance budget for it. And we started repainting all this gold and ornamentation, all the colors. That's all our work. Wow, that is it incredible. We started at one end of the lobby and worked our way down over a period of several weeks to the other end. And we went upstairs and worked our way back. Wow. And it took several months in our spare time. And, uh, but we brought it back to its original look. That so is what fantastic. you see here today is what it looked like originally. Wow, man. So... Yeah, you've got the, the blue in the coffered ceiling up there, and you've got all these heraldic shields all over in various designs. Yeah. They're painted red and green and gold, and it's all the original oh, colors and the great. original patterns. are very painstakingly reconstructed. Wow. Over here you've got, this is a cool little detail. These, are, these windows into the auditorium are what were known as crying windows, because if you had a baby that was crying and you didn't want to interrupt the show, you could get up, of course, remember Brilliant this, this was idea. silent film days, so you weren't missing any dialogue. You could come up, take your baby, and stand here at these windows and look through at the show, and you wouldn't miss anything. Incredible. And your baby wouldn't disturb the people inside. Incredible. So, um, so you see this beautiful ornamentation all the yeah. way down. down here at the bottom, there's the three graces Whoa. from classical uh, oh. uh, mythology, I guess it is. Wow. And, yeah, you can see they're all sculpted in the plaster there. Dude. Um, that is cool. So yeah, the this, crying window. This gold is all spray paint. Mmm. Because we couldn't find a brush on paint that was bright enough to show properly under this reduced lighting. Oh. So we had to use spray paint, which meant everything we painted had to be masked with newspaper and masking tape. Everything that was painted gold. This window, with all these little nooks and crannies, took three hours to mask. Oh my gosh. And, and then we spayed it in ten minutes and then pulled all the masking down. <laughs> Incredible. But, yeah. Wow. But I am so fortunate to have had the opportunities that I've had and to, to get the volunteers that I had. Yeah. And to have you guys developed the relationship with United here. Artists that I did. Um, because they were a little nervous about meeting us originally. Mm. Uh, because they have, you know, United Artists is, you know, I guess they're still around, I don't know. But they were a huge movie theater chain. They had theaters in many, many cities. And they had a few other old properties like this one in other cities. And they had had um, preservationists approach them in other cities. And those preservationists often took a sort of antagonistic approach, right? Mm. Like, we're going to tell you what you can and cannot do with your building. Mm. And I, I learned, when I learned about that, I realized that is not the way to approach someone like this if you want to, to really accomplish something. Yeah. So I had a small collection of, of old photographs by this time that I had gotten from a local photo archive. And so I introduced myself to the theater manager, told him who we were and a small group of volunteers and what we wanted to do, and showed him the photographs. And he called up, not necessarily the same day, but um, we came back I don't know, a few days later, and he had called up his superiors in Fresno in the district office, mm -hmm. and they came out here, and I reiterated my same pitch to them. I says, we're not here to tell you what to do with the building. We just want to bring it back to the glory that it used to have so that people will enjoy it and appreciate it again. And I must have made a favorable impression because they allowed us to go ahead with the work. And we were also allowed to install the pipe organ the original organ had been removed in the 50s, mm. so the chambers were empty, and we installed this one ourselves. It took almost four years. Oh my gosh! Uh, in our spare time on the weekends, and um, this was the only time, the first and so far as I know, only time that volunteers had installed an organ in one of UA's old theaters. So that was, uh, you know, a bit of a feather in our caps. But um, yeah, the we we went through. 
a succession of several managers while we were working on this, as you might expect. You know, people get promoted and somebody oh, else yeah. comes in. Uh, and one of the, the managers who is really, really the one of the best friends we ever had, his name was Brad Johnson. And um, it was it was such a joy working with him. He was very strict and businesslike, but he did a lot of favors for us because we did a lot of favors for him. Mm. And uh, he was the one that paid for the paint and all the rest of the stuff that we did. Wow. You um, just had such a cooperative uh, group of people helping yeah. put this thing together. Yeah. And it's great that they all appreciated it and they saw the value in what you were trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was very fortunate that way. And um, so eventually he, uh, he became successful enough that they promoted him. <laughs> I was really happy for him and his family. He got promoted up to a, a much larger theater in the East Bay, uh, San Francisco area. And of course, the way the, the wage, I mean, the, the compensation structure worked, the bigger your theater, the more you got paid. Oh, okay. Right? Which is good, because it will work for you. Uh, so it was a big step up the career ladder for him. I was so happy for him and his family, but at the same time, we were so sorry to lose him oh. from Monterey because he had done so many good things for us. Wow. Um, so, yeah, Brad Johnson, super guy. I hope he's still very successful wherever he is and whatever he's doing now. And this was 20-plus years ago, and so I don't know what he's doing now. I haven't been in contact with him. But Dude, well, Martin, thank so you so you. much for, my pleasure. for well, telling thank me you you know, for your time and, all this great and stuff. This is so exciting. All my rambling stories. No, this is perfect, and, it, you know, this is... You know, I cannot wait to share this with the listeners. I mean, this is just going to be great. Wow. That interview is from 3-17-2023 at the Golden State Theater. Yet once again, I have to remind you of that. What an insightful conversation we had there with Martin. Very insightful. Um... I love talking to people who have such deep interests, go down the rabbit holes, all, you know, do all of the deep dives, searching through the archives, investigating the yesteryear. It, it makes a location so much more rich. Uh, it's just fascinating. Just absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sticking around for part two of this. Um, I have no doubt that the, the next time we play at the Monterey Golden State Theater, I will be interviewing Martin again about a whole wide variety of other things. Um, in addition to most likely more history about the Golden State Theater. I'm sure we could go through that place piece by piece. And he's got a fun story about uh, what he and his team had done to put that together. Uh, next up, we got a very fun message from Man Behind the Machine. Let's check that out and see what uh, is in store. Danger zone. Danger zone. Gonna take danger you zone. to the oh. danger zone. Danger zone. No, just three times. Just three times. Danger, danger zone. zone. Danger zone. Highway danger zone. To the danger zone. Inspirato Projecto Radio. This is Man and Mr. Man Behind the Machine. Right, Man? Say hi, Mr. Man. Say hi, Mr. Inspirato. Hey. Hi. Exemplary. Exemplary. Ow! Ow! The crowd is going wild. Ow! Exemplary rendition of Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins. Extraordinary. We play that song um, at Yachtly Crew, which, by the way, just to let you all know, that, that interview with Martin Schmidt uh, took place at the Golden State Theater because Yachtly Crew was playing there on 317-2023. Uh, we, uh, during the Yachtly Crew shows, we play Danger Zone um, halfway through, and I'm not going to tell you what happens. You're going to have to see the show to see what, what's going on there. But my goodness, Man Behind the Machine, thank you so much for adding voice message and, and letting uh, Mr. Man 
just let loose? Uh, I think, I think if, uh, when it came time for part two, for Top Gun part two to come out, if they would have known that this song ex existed, they would have completely put it right there in the opening credits. I just know it. I just know it. So thank you so much. By the way, folks, if you're, uh, if you have not listened to Man Behind the Machine podcast, check that out. It's very insightful. Man Behind the Machine. Very good stuff. And now I'm going to leave you with this little giblet from my brother, Pauly Shores. I play the character Stony Shores in Yachtly Crew. This is from my brother from another mother or from the same Yachtly Crew mother. Uh, the mother of Yacht Rock. His name is Pauly Shores. He's, he's the sexy sax man. And uh, go ahead, Pauly. Take it away. Inspirado. Protrapto. Inspirado. 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 